everyone. Welcome to this edition of 101 with Montgomery County Executive Isaiah Leggett. I'm Lorna Vigili and thank you for watching. Hello, Mr. Leggett. How are you? Terrific. How are you today? I'm doing great. Summer's <laughs> here. We're happy, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> um, let's get started with the FY16 operational budget. It was just a few days, into, went into effect just a few days, and uh, county department directors were asked to cut back 2% of the budgets. What is that impact for most of the departments? Well, it's a pretty significant impact because you have to keep in mind that the budget that I presented, and one ultimately the council added a little bit more on top of that, originally only increased by 1.1%. And so when you say that you're going to have a 2% cutback, that's less than the growth of the FY16 budget. Therefore, you cannot avoid the fact that you would impact some programs and services, uh, much of which people had anticipated and wanted, and I could understand that. But given the challenges that we face, I like to be proactive to get out in front of the problem and try to resolve it before we have the magnitude of a problem that we can't resolve. And so this is prudence, this is something that's necessary, and something that we need to do and need to do it sooner than later. So I'm asking uh, that we have a 2% uh, cutback from our departments. Uh, we will hopefully mandate something later on with the work of the county council. Uh, but we need to get started on reducing what I think could be a significant gap for the remain of FY16 as, and certainly for into FY17. What is the bulk of that gap? More or less? Well, that gap right now varies, but at least uh, you may be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 million. Did you, you say 50 zero? 150, yes. Okay. Okay. And you may look at that and say, well, we resolved budgetary gaps in the past that were much larger. But in reality, we had more options available for us uh, for, to us in the past than we have today. Uh, some of the things that we've done in the past, it's not readily available for us today. And so we have to deal with a smaller number, but one that comes as a result of challenges that we've had in reducing some taxes, increased expenditures, and with fewer options that we have to deal with that. And as I've indicated in the past, this certainly will suggest a, a, a property tax increase. Uh, we've avoided that essentially for the last two years, two years running. Uh, but I think given the circumstances and conditions that we face, uh, this suggests a fairly significant tax increase. Uh, if we don't have savings, if we don't have the ability to reduce that, then that tax increase could be pretty, pretty substantial. And I want to reduce that. So we'll have a combination of cuts, reductions, as well as a potential tax increase for FY17, in my opinion. And the challenges come from the reduced revenue projections? Well, a combination of things. Uh, reduced revenue projection, which is about $21 million now uh, below the estimate. Uh, but more importantly, as a result of the win case, uh, which has a significant impact in FY17. Uh, uh, when all is told, you look at the impact of the wind case, both the retroactive effect as well as the ongoing effect, it is quite substantial. And so it's something that we wanted to avoid, but the Supreme Court made a decision against the state of Maryland that impacts all the jurisdictions locally throughout the state. Uh, we happen to be the most significantly impacted as a result of that. So you take the law. Uh, estimates, increase expenditures, as well as the win case itself, uh, and reductions of some revenue uh, over the last few years, it gets us at a point where we have to make some adjustments. When you say significant um, increases in property taxes, that would be for FY17, correct? That's correct. And um, how significant, uh, since you're already look, looking into it, well, how, it, how it, is care for homeowners <laughs> in the county? Well, it, it could vary, but keep in mind, just, just use the number 150150 for the time period. Uh, that number could change based on what happens in labor negotiations which starts this fall. We still have one additional tax distribution that is due in November, uh, So, and it does not include monies for snow emergencies, other challenges that we may have throughout the year. So when you combine all of those things together, the likelihood is that number can go much higher. So if you looked at a tax increase that will compensate or cover all of those things, it's pretty significant. You're maybe talking as much as a 10, 11 percent tax increase if you do it solely as a result of tax increases. Uh, that's not the way that I would want to deal with that problem. I would want to deal with, with a reduction 
and some expenditures that are projected for FY16 as well as further reductions in FY17. Uh, my view is that the combination potentially of further reductions in the projected budget for FY16 as well as some revenue enhancement in FY17 hopefully will get us there. And what's been the feedback from uh, department directors, especially the bigger departments like health and human services, housing, uh, transportation, and of course the public safety uh, uh, departments? Well, they are concerned, and rightfully so, because they understand that it means that there could very well be reductions, and you cannot avoid reductions in programs that severely uh, impact programs that I think the public has a great deal of confidence and rely upon to some degree. You can't avoid that when you look at the budget overall. There are areas that are very, very few in number that you can totally protect. Uh, but we'll try to look at them and prioritize that so that you really don't get 2% average, as a 2% average across the board. Some departments very well may pay more than that, uh, reduce it more than that, and others will probably be less depending on the priorities and the kinds of offsets that we may have. But uh, if you average it, it's 2%, but uh, certainly uh, we will not see the same uniformly across the board because there are priorities of different things in various departments that we may protect, at least attempt to protect that may have a different outcome than 2% per se. Let's talk about transportation. Good news from Annapolis. The governor announced the go-ahead from the state for the Purple Line. However, he did mention the fact that the contributions for from both counties, uh, Prince George's and also Montgomery County, would be a little higher than expected. Have you circled back with the governor, talked about it uh, a bit? Well, we've talked to his staff and we're ongoing in terms of discussions to make sure that the scope of the project is precisely what we all think that it should be and whatever changes, that those changes are something that we mutually agree upon. Uh, secondly, we need to make sure uh, what that amount, time frames of how the county can respond to the challenges that we have as it relates to the amount that Montgomery County and possibly Prince George's County would have to pay locally. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion that will take some time to, to get through all of that, but I'm confident based on everything that we've negotiated and discussed thus far that we can make all of this work. It may not work precisely the way we originally intended, but this is a project that's well worthwhile. The governor has indicated his desire to move forward with the project. Uh, we have a willingness and, and response to his request to provide some local revenues. We now have to work through the details, but ultimately, I'm convinced that all of this can be worked out, and uh, it's a go for the project, in my opinion. It is. We're going to take a short break, break Mr. Leggett, and we're going to be right back. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with 101 with Montgomery County Executive Isaiah Leggett. There's a reason why area law enforcement are out enforcing pedestrian and traffic safety laws and preventing killer pedestrian crashes. Be alert. Be street smart. The next 30 seconds can save you a lot of money. Just do your laundry in cold and stick to full loads. Auto sleep your computers. Plug your gadgets in a power strip and switch it off when you're done. Head it out. Turn back your thermostat by 10 degrees. And drive sensibly. The more energy you save, the more money you save. Find other great tips at energysaver.gov. Starting today, you can be active and treat yourself to a wide array of great activities offered by Montgomery County Recreation. With four indoor aquatic facilities and 20 community rec centers that offer exercise and weight rooms, you'll find everything you want from sports and fitness to senior activities, from cooking to dancing, classes, trips, and tours. Yes, starting today, you can work toward a healthier lifestyle. Learn a new skill, relax a little, or just meet new people. 
Visit our website to see all the exciting programs, activities, and classes available to you. And be active, Montgomery. Welcome back to 101 with Montgomery County Executive Vice Dad Leggett. I'm Lorna Virgili. Before the break, we were talking about the Purple Line. It is a go ahead, and you were talking about the fact that there's going to be a lot of uh, negotiations back and forth with the state to finally decide what's going to be ultimately the Purple Line. You wanted to add to that. Yeah, I, I wanted to, first of all, acknowledge the work on behalf of the governor and his staff. The Secretary of Transportation has worked with us over the last few months. Uh, to put us in a position now that we can go forward with this project. I think there were some doubts earlier whether or not the governor would come forward with a plan that will allow the project to go forward. I think that he has responded quite favorably. Uh, we now simply have to work through the details to make sure that it happens at a cost that uh, I think is acceptable and fair to Montgomery County, a time frame and a scope of a project that I think responds to our citizens' concern. But this is far better position to be in than having the project rejected. Uh, we are in a position now that we can go forward. I do not see anything that's insurmountable that we cannot ultimately work through and get this project moving forward. You mentioned cost. So far, what is the tap for Montgomery County? Well, if you combine some of the existing things that we've already done, such as uh, uh, purchasing the, uh, uh, the right-of-way for it, uh, some of the land acquisitions and some of the other things that we've done, the pro projected plans for the south entrance of Bethesda, as well as the potential $50 million that we've discussed earlier, uh, this very wild and total amount could be about $200 million for Montgomery County. We've either budgeted for some of that already or some of the things we've already paid for. Uh, we will have to move forward in a time frame in terms of when and how we pay the rest of the project, uh, at least for the local cost. But I think, again, uh, we are in a position that we can move forward, and uh, I believe that given the numbers that I've seen thus far, we can make it work. Okay. Recently, you signed into law the Earn Sick and Safe Leave Bill in Montgomery County, highly attended event in, in downtown Silver Spring at the Civic Center. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Department of Labor uh, Secretary, Tom Perez, was there for the signing of this bill. What does it mean as far as protections for Roughly, what, 90,000 employees in Montgomery County? Yes, yeah, about 90,000 in Montgomery County, but if you look around the country as a whole, there's 43 million uh, people th throughout the United States do not have this type of protection, and that's totally unacceptable. Uh, we are the only advanced nation in the world that does not provide this type of leave, and I think it's really time for us now to respond to that. Unfortunately, we have not done it at the national level. We clearly have not done it at the state level. And so we have to do it here locally to at least get this ball moving and to make certain that we do what is right for our employees. This is the right thing to do. Uh, people that we're talking about have little flexibility and they have some hard choices to make. Uh, do they stay home with their sick child? Do they go to work when they're possibly a little bit ill? Uh, people who are working in environments that could uh, have some adverse effects on the entire public. And I think it's at a cost and a level that uh, employers should be able to afford with little adjustment. So uh, we are responding to a national problem. Uh, we are doing it here in Montgomery County. And I'm hopeful that the rest of the state will adopt similar measures around the state so that we can provide the protection for not just residents of Montgomery County, but those throughout the entire state of Maryland. But it really will be helpful to people who are faced with these very difficult choices between staying home losing pay and the ability to go to work when they may be just a little bit ill. And basically employees are earning those hours that are going to be out That's right. sick up to yes. seven days per year, correct? That's right. And we made some adjustments also for those small businesses who find five and fewer employees so that we can balance that through, uh, that they could get uh, some earned leave rather than to be paid. So to give those small employers some level of flexibility. Something else that was addressed on that bill is domestic uh, violence and the fact that employees could take days off, those days off, to attend court, whether it's for them or a relative. Oh, that's true because uh, it's a, a real problem for a number of uh, employees around the, around the county and uh, hopefully uh, we will avoid that problem altogether and reduce domestic violence to start with. Uh, so you don't want to have uh, this to be uh, a response to the problem, we would hope to have 
uh, not have the problem to begin with. And so we're working on two fronts. One, to avoid and to prevent domestic violence, but in the cases where they do occur, give the families of those who are victims some possibility of, of, of earned leave uh, or paid leave so they could go to court and provide protection for themselves and their families. It was addressed as a public health issue as well. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about economic development. County Council approved um, legislation you sent them regarding privatizing uh, the county's Department of Economic Development. So this, is it nine or 11 member board? 11. 11, it's gonna be 11 members on the board. When are they transitioning in uh, officially and when is this new format entity start operating? Okay, well the legislation doesn't kick in until October of this year. Uh, the next round of the process will be as follows. We will hopefully uh, name a board uh, of 11 people that has to go to the county council for confirmation and probably sometime this fall uh, that board will go into place. That board then will uh, start to select uh, an executive director or a president or CEO uh, who will then fill out the staff. Probably sometime after the first of the year uh, they will probably be in an operational mode. It may take them a little bit longer to be in full operation but the process this fall would be the naming of the board, selection of the CEO, and hopefully by the end of the year they start selecting the staff that they want and start operating. Uh, I think this is a good transition for us in Montgomery County. It provides us, I think, with a new set of eyes, ears, and expertise to deal with a very competitive area of economic development. It places our business community squarely uh, at the head of the table, engaged and involved and actively participating in economic development. Uh, it makes us, I think, better in terms of the competition for the future and our ability to move forward to provide additional jobs, expand our tax base, and make Montgomery County far more competitive for the future. That was uh, key, economic competitiveness. And how yeah. do you foresee that they're gonna put this into practice, number one, and number two, still foster the small businesses in, in the county, which represent, what, 95% of the businesses? Well, first of all, the, the, we anticipate all business benefiting from this, certainly the small business, which make up the bulk of the employees. But the answers as to how all of that is done will not be something that Ike Leggett, this county executive, will dictate or determine. It will be left up to the board. We will simply support the board, and we're gonna rely a great part on their expertise and their insights and their wisdom as it relates to economic development. We will support that and continue to do other things to help to enhance economic development, but the decisions as to how they will go about doing that, the methodologies and perceived people and the procedures to accomplish that will be determined by the board. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Leger. We're gonna be right back. We're gonna take a short break and we'll be coming right back with Montgomery County Executive Ike Leggett. Stay tuned. <music> minutes of physical activity a day and eating well can help get your child healthy. So keep them active and eating well every day. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. That's letsmove.gov. So I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but you know, she's putting them in the same basket again. It's like, hello, that's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide and go seek. Are you sure they can recycle us, Clamshell? Hey, Dome, we're on a new recycling postcard. I can't wait to make a new start. Maybe I'll be a red carpet at a big premiere. And I'll get to paint the White House. Shh, here he comes. <laughs> Now you can recycle more plastics in Montgomery County, including number one PET plastics such as clamshells, deli containers, trays, lids, domes, and cups. Woohoo! We're in! For more information on recycling, contact the Montgomery County, Maryland Division of Solid Waste Services at 311. The wait is over. Recycle more plastics today. Did you know there are more than 10,000 county government phone numbers? But there's only one number you need to remember for non emergency calls 311. MC311 is Montgomery County government's online telephone information system. 
Need information? Have a problem or complaint? Trying to locate a county government facility? Call 311. The call center is open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The website is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Well, thank you for staying tuned to 101 with Montgomery County Executive Isaiah Leggett. I'm Lauren Virgili. Uh, Mr. Leggett, you wanted to add a little bit more about the privatization of the Department of Economic Development. Well, first of all, I want to thank the County Council, uh, its membership, uh, especially Nancy Florine and the others on the Council, George Leventhal and Roger Berliner, uh, people who have been engaged in this fight for some time and have made some efforts to help transition Montgomery County to this process. They moved the legislation through, I think, in a very good and timely fashion. And so they should be given a great deal of credit for the earlier work that they performed in this regard and helping to make this transition possible. I believe that we have a good model to go forward. And I think when we look at the accountability measures that are built into the legislation, our expectations are that we will be in a much, much better position in terms of economic development going forward. But this was a collaborative effort. Uh, myself and the members of the county council as well. Okay, um, let's talk about let's transition into the police department. Uh, this summer, they started the pilot program wearing the body worn uh, video cameras. Mm -hmm. Have you received any feedback from uh, the chief of police regarding what's going on with the program thus far? I think it's too early to have any kind of hard data as it relates to uh, the functionality of it and some of the early results that will come back to. Uh, let us know how that is working. Certainly when you introduce uh, a new procedure such as this into uh, a functional operational setting, uh, there are always bugs to work out and uh, try to make sure that uh, people are compatible with the technology uh, that we are providing, the kind of transparency that we want. We'll look at the results and then make a further analysis based upon what we have. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a, an ample sample, a good number of people actually utilize them in different categories within the police department. Even the chief himself uh, has a camera on and some of the others as well. But uh, I think it's too early for us to look at the results of what we have. Uh, but we are determined uh, that this is a direction that we want to go and determined that it's something that can enhance uh, both the transparency of what we do that provide greater protection for the police officers and accountability, as well as giving some reassurances to the public about how work is engaged through the police operation on a day-to-day -day basis. Recently, you sent uh, some recommendations to County Council regarding a pending towing legislation. Um, apparently, towing, it's one of the number one complaints filed with the Office of Consumer Protection in, in the county. Uh, this would certainly change what curb aggressive towing is in private parking lots and commercial parking lots throughout the county. Uh, what do you foresee would happen with that? I'm hopeful that we will get a much better process, one that has greater transparency, one that is fair to those who are uh, victims of the predatory towing, and I use that word uh, very, very carefully because uh, what we have in some cases are people who are hovering around uh, parking lots uh, on the go to pick up someone that they're there, you know, one minute beyond the time frame of walking to the lot, unaware because they didn't read the sign. Uh, there are some places where obviously uh, parkers are taking advantage of the, some bodies, vacant lot or parking areas and impeding commerce in a few areas here and there. But uh, we've had too many complaints about the aggressiveness of towing in Montgomery County. And we need to put a halt to that. And I think the legislation that both Roger Berliner and I have put in and those things that I've added as amendments possible to that will give a greater balance to that, providing transparency, uh, not allowing people to charge some of the outrageous charges they're making, and, and not providing enough information so that people are aware about what the effects and how they can challenge some of the th problems that occur with touring. Uh, this will give us a better hold on it and hopefully reduce some of the complaints by reducing some of the predatory of touring in Montgomery County. This is something that we greatly need to respond to. It is one of the most significant areas of complaints we get in consumer protection throughout the county. Let's talk about the Silver Spring uh, Library Grant opening. 
Oh, wow. That was superly well attended. As a matter of fact, I got some numbers. From noon that day to 6 p.m., there were 3,960 people that checked out over 4,500 items of that library that one day. Those are just the people who checked items out. There were far more people who were there who didn't check items out, who simply came to browse, to look, to observe, and to make certain that they had a chance to look at the new library. Uh, it was an exciting day for us. Uh, it was one that I think uh, is a reflection of how we look and view libraries in Montgomery County, that they are a valuable part of our community, a valuable part of what we provide service to our residents, and something that helps us in terms of jobs, education, connectivity, community gathering place, and in the Silver Spring Library, we have all of this in a wonderful architectural setting that's right in the heart of Silver Spring. Uh, it is a wonderful addition to the community and one that I think will be a reflection of the values of Montgomery County and how important we believe libraries are and what they are doing for our community overall. It is a magnificent state-of-the-art facility, the building. It's beautiful. You were there. What was your favorite part of the building? I think the <laughs> section that uh, you have at the top for children, mm -hmm. the children's section that I think is innovative, uh, it's fun. Um, but it also is educational and informative for young people. And I think there are some great possibilities there for permitting families and educators together, providing a setting for children that they can become much more actively engaged in the learning process. And you're doing it all in a library setting that I think accommodates all of the needs for a modern library. Um, coming up is Wheaton. Is it going to be similar or better? Well, we're going to provide what I think I is mean, you just got to keep it going up. You can't come down after that Silver Spring. I'm just well, saying. Well, the one in Whedon will be a combination library recreational center. And I think once we finish with the, the residents in and around Whedon, we'll be quite proud of the product that we produce because I think there's something that the community wants. And it shows, again, uh, the values that we place in libraries and making certain that it's a hub of our community. And I think people in Whedon will be wowed by that library once it's completed as well. Before we close the show, let's talk about the County Executive's Hispanic Gala, which is uh, coming up in the fall, and uh, scholarships for what used to be Latino students. Now it's been opened up to all students that do qualify of our diverse community. Oh, certainly. And it's a wonderful uh, contribution by that, uh, that the community makes a role to students who are in need to attend colleges throughout this state. Uh, we've had a wonderful time and uh, helping to make sure that this is a reality. It is now turning into a wonderful event. And thank you for your leadership in helping to get this started. I think this will be a good uh, key to the legacy of Montgomery County that we are really a very diverse community, that we're providing opportunity and access in this gala. is certainly a reflection of that, and people can participate by contributing to it, and they can also participate by coming out and. Uh, being part of the effectiveness. Uh, it's a wonderful event and we look forward to another exciting year. Thank you, Mr. Leggett. We ran out of time. Yeah. Uh, I wish you a safe and fun summer. <laughs> 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 and for you watching at home, do remember any information regarding Montgomery County government to visit MontgomeryCountyMD.gov. I'm Lorna Virgili and thank you for watching. <laughs>can be a great way to stay cool and beat the summer heat. Hi, I'm Gabe Albernaz, director of the Montgomery County Recreation Department, and I'd like to ask you to be our partner in making this a safe summer. Drowning is a leading cause of accidental deaths in children, but drowning can be avoided. By following a few important rules, we can ensure that our children are safe at the pools. Regardless of swimming ability, children should never be unsupervised, even with lifeguards. There is no substitution for adult supervision. Minimize distractions such as cell phones. Drowning can happen in minutes. If you have to leave the pool for any reason, you need to take your children with you. Inflatable swimming aids such as floaties and noodles are not life safety devices. Do not substitute these for supervision either. By working together, we can make sure we are all safe at the pool this summer.